me now, the man himself, the brilliant Africana scholar, the professor of Africana studies at Howard University, Dr. Greg Card. My brother Greg, good to see you. Always good to see you. I'm trying to be a reflection of you. You the man, brother. It's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, now, yes, I, yes, I, yes. We could brother. go on and on about. We could, we could. That's I appreciate advice. you. I I have, you. You already know. <laughs> right. This, 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 this is black man introduction. <laughs> no question. <laughs> and it's ours. Ain't nobody give it to Talk us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Talk to me about uh, Juneteenth. I, there's so much to say, but in brief terms, what is the history of, of, of Juneteenth? What does it mean? Well, Juneteenth is one of the many rituals of black self-determination that we developed in the hemisphere. Um, its connections aren't to July 4th. Its connections aren't to the American calendar. Its connections are to the Emancipation Day celebrations of the Caribbean. Um, to the uh, Freedom Day celebrations here in the United States, to January 1st traditions of Emancipation Day, uh, marking the signing of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. But most importantly, it's a self-determination ritual that came into existence as the Union Army marched westward and announced to folk that they were no longer enslaved. And many of the folk who did that announcing looked like us. They were black men. Uh, the, the army was increasingly black, in fact, as people of African descent mustered into the army and those who were white began to muster out. So by the time you get to January, I'm sorry, when, by the time you get to July, uh, well, to June 1865 in Galveston, uh, Texas, uh, which is an island in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Gordon Granger, who was there, uh, who was given too much credit because Grant didn't like him. And the only thing that stopped him from uh, being relieved of duty was his friend, Frills Sheridan. Uh, he doesn't even read that special order number three. And there are not very many black people in Galveston at the time. But you know what's interesting about that general order? That's not special order. General order number three. In that little, in that little couple of lines lies the central dilemma, which makes Juneteenth the blackest holiday on the federal calendar. Uh, and, and it's really very basic. Number one, all slaves are free. Now, we know, and as you've been talking about the 13th Amendment, that's not true. The, the enslaved in Delaware were not legally freed until December of that year when the 13th Amendment was finally ratified. In places like Mississippi uh, and my home state, Tennessee, they didn't ratify uh, the 13th Amendment until our lifetimes. Of course, it was moot by then, but, but that's neither here nor there. Then they say, and then he says, uh, you have absolute equality and personal rights and rights over property. That introduces the concept of citizenship before there's even a 14th Amendment. And this is going to be important in a second to talk about what happens, the effect that has on people of African descent. But then you see the stuff getting snatched back. The, the, the general order says, assume an employer-employee relationship with your former enslavers. Well, there's the betrayal. As you know and I know, my friend Catherine Frankie at Columbia wrote the book Repair. There's the betrayal. Wait, no land, no reparations? No, nah, now you go from uh, enslaved through body to, to debt slavery and wage slavery. And then finally, the law and order phrase. Remain at your present homes and uh, don't come to the army lines. We're not going to take care of you and we won't support you in your idleness. First of all, I ain't got no home. You took me from my home, my people. <laughs> and second of all, oh, now you telling me I'm idle after I done built the whole damn country? Just in those two paragraphs, brother. And, the, and so finally, what do the Africans do as the word spreads? They say it is time now for us to build the world we want to live in, which is why even if it's a federal holiday, it can never be fully integrated. To use uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's description of a resident of Galveston, Texas, born 12 years after that, uh, the Galveston giant, the great uh, Jack Johnson, Du Bois called Jack Johnson unforgivably black. Well, Juneteenth is the unforgivably mm. black fellow federal holiday brother it can't it can't be melted down we ain't gotta worry about unforgivably black it's unforgivably black. i was gonna say they, they're gonna try and take it from us but they're gonna try and take it from us doc they you know i mean i right now we're looking at uh you know righteous righteous celebrations but what happens in 10 years when, when it's when the big box retailers got juneteenth sales and people trying to get their juneteenth discount and people having juneteenth parades <laughs> in the same way when i saw uh, Nancy Pelosi wearing kente cloth and taking a knee when all we wanted was some damn legislation. I'm wondering how they're going to make this an, an, another co-optable holiday. Am I being too cynical? No, no, Baba. You already know, Doc. You already know. Ten years, ten minutes. They've already got the shelf stock, bro. They already <laughs> moving to the red, black, and green. And that's cool because that's on us. We, what we often rob ourselves of is the momentum of memory. I was very fortunate. My friend, Ajwa Batwe Osmoa, who did uh, African-American outreach for the Biden-Harris campaign, 
um, invited me. And I was down there yesterday and got to sit with 94 year old Opal Lee. And I'm gonna tell you right now, when that elder grabbed Joe Biden, no, he, she didn't grab him. She was in her wheelchair. He had to get on his knee at her feet. And let me be very clear. I don't really care what any white people think, but standing there talking to my friend, Audrey Carson out of Indianapolis or standing there with Stephen Horsford from Nevada, uh, Congressman Horsford, whose people are from Trinidad and saying, you know what? This is like uh, Emancipation Day in Trinidad. He said, yeah, that's an interesting combination. Or Yvette Clark from New York where they've had Juneteenth, uh, Dwight Evans from Philly, of course, up there with you. You know how long we've been doing. Y'all been doing Philly in, 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 in uh, um, Juneteenth. Uh, the contingent from California. So it isn't just Celia Jackson Lee. It isn't just Texas, but seeing those black people in that black as hell room where that bill was signed is a reminder that it's on no one else to interpret Juneteenth. And no matter how many uh, Juneteenth specials they mount, no matter how many Juneteenth diversity equity conversations they have going forward, every June 19th is an opportunity for us to continue the momentum of memory and the parades and the self-determination movements. In fact, when you see Juneteenth parades, when you see Juneteenth rituals, they are always combined with the, with the demand. That is the history of Juneteenth. The struggle for voting rights, the struggle for property acquisition and community advancement, the struggle to make sure not just that there's equity, but there is black self-determination. So all of those things are on us, brother. They're on us. I mean, the, the momentum of memory, we rob ourselves of it when we act as if they gave us something. This is the holiday that no one would ever give black people. We just started doing it and they couldn't stop it. And so they can't even hope to contain it now unless we lose our memory. Hmm. So you started to answer this question, but what does celebration look like? You know, for a long time with Martin Luther King Day, uh, people just, you know, celebrated how far we'd overcome. And then some people said, let's have it be a day of service. You know, I've been of the tradition to say it's not a day of service, it's a day of radical action, whether it's radical study, radical organizing, et cetera. For Juneteenth, you've talked about this idea of memory. You've talked about this idea of making demands from the state of, of, and, and others of what we want. When you think about what a proper Juneteenth celebration looks like, how, how, does, it, how does it appear for you? Well, brother, I go into the archive. Uh, I go into the archive because we all know uh, to, uh, to, to evoke the, uh, the skills of your adopted homie, the great Allen Iverson. They crossed us over on Martin Luther King <laughs> because uh, how you trick a whole nation of people into <laughs> painting the walls at the school after Dr. King would be like, well, what did they do with your tax money? I thought those walls were already supposed to be painted. So, OK, y'all crossed us over on that one a little bit. But on Juneteenth, we go into the archive of memory. When you see Juneteenth celebrations around this country, uh, the, the first ones, they had parades. And in those in the front of the parade were the elders, those who had been enslaved followed by the soldiers, the black soldiers, the Liberation Army, followed by increasingly black business people. In fact, Houston, they bought property. Uh, George Floyd, of course, as we know, went to a high school named for a brother, Jack Yates, who was one of four Africans who bought property and created Emancipation Park to celebrate Juneteenth. And they gave speeches. And increasingly, white folks, politicians and others began asking, can, can we speak at Juneteenth? Why? Because we need your votes. Yeah, you can come up here if you're talking right. If not, we drill you out. And so if we want to mm. know how to celebrate Juneteenth, all we have to do, in fact, I'll end with this. Black News Channel is part of the black press. All you have to do is go into the black press, go to the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the local papers in Texas, papers like the one that was in Dallas by the brother who actually helped fight Smith versus Allwright and Sweat versus Painter, the great Maceo Sims, who came in the 1930s and revived the spirit of Juneteenth. Go to the black newspapers and the black press. They'll show you how they did it. And that's how we need to continue to do it. Uh, Dr. Carr, there are a wide range of responses uh, to Juneteenth. Of course, the bulk of black folk are like, good. Then there's some folk that are like, this is a distraction. And then there's the extreme minority that we often amplify too much that are saying this is wrong. So I want to I want to focus on the latter two. But but really, I want to focus on the, the black people who are principled and who love black people and who are saying, look, they out here shutting down history classes. They throwing away the 1619 project. They're damn near criminalizing critical race theory, even when they don't know what it is. And then they throw you Juneteenth. What do you make? What do you make of that kind of uh, analysis? Well, brother, Barack Obama didn't pardon Jack Johnson. Donald Trump did. Uh, mm. You got to use whatever tools are available to you to advance your struggle. The fundamental question that I have, and I think you have, we share this question, in fact, I know we do, is the question that another resident of Philadelphia now, the great Sonia Sanchez always asked, uh-huh, 
but how do it free us? In other words, we have to step back from ideology and look at every tool. Juneteenth is a ritual that came out of our momentum of self-determination. Uh, in Richmond, Virginia, for example, when they started doing it heavy, by the 1990s, one of the people they honored was uh, Oliver Hill, who fought Brown versus Board of Education. So when folks say they gave us, first of all, I'm saying, who gave us Juneteenth? We gave ourselves Juneteenth. That's number one. Number two, Ron Johnson had a hold on it in the United States Senate from last June when it was introduced. He could have lifted that hold in January or February, and this bill would have been signed then, and people wouldn't have had to scramble to get to the White House yesterday. That's number two. And then finally, the question that you ask, the first question you should ask is, can we use this to help free us? The answer is unequivocally yes. We know that these cycles, these things come in cycles. Can we cut our space to operate? In the last few years, it's been Black Lives Matter. Over the last year, it's been Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Over the last few months, it's been critical race theory. Over the last few weeks, they're talking about Juneteenth. But the thing that holds this in common is that this settler state is being renegotiated. The reason they're holding up criti uh, critical race theory, CRT, the reason they're talking about 1619 has nothing to do with 1619 or, 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 or the critical race theory as we talked about before. It's all about 2022 and 2024 and elections. They're rallying their white nationalist base. There's a reason Mississippi in 1995 finally adopted the uh, the 13th Amendment. There's a reason that uh, it was finally passed um, in Kentucky in, in the 1970s. The reason is that you've got a diehard core of people in this country who say, when I say America, I mean white. So when they say voter fraud, what they mean is they let you vote. And so what we have to understand is that Juneteenth, in the spirit of Juneteenth, we use that as just another wedge to crack the foundations of a settler colony, renegotiate the terms and build the society we want to live in. And I think everybody can agree that that's what we want ultimately. Is there any danger that the Juneteenth becomes another thing that's used actually to rally the opposition? In other words, when we have a uh, 1619 project and then they, they are able to take, you, know, you got people who, 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 never, who don't even know what 1619 means who are outraged by it. People who, who can't even tell you what a CRT book looks like, who's, who've never picked anything up, who are marching down the street against it, right? It's, it's like, does giving black people Juneteenth or, or giving another black people holiday, does that, does that creation or that narrative make it easier for our opposition in 2022 and 2024 to get mobilized? Because like, look, they're taking the country. Look, they're stealing our votes. Look, they're changing our schools. And now look, they got our holidays. I think yes, the answer to that is unequivocally yes. The, and then the question becomes, what are we going to do about it? Joe Manchin introduces a weak sauce version of a voting rights bill. Stacey Abrams immediately says, I can get on board with what you've proposed. And then we keep pushing. So immediately, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell comes out and sees, said it's a black. Bringing us into this field of violence called the settler colonies that became the United States of America was the unforgivable act. So there's really nothing we can do not to rally the base, the white nationalist base. Our presence rallies the white nationalist base. But the question has always been, what are we going to do about it? When you see Reverend Barber come into West Virginia, Joe Manchin got to back up. That poor people's movement that he and, and Liz Theo Harris are, are at the center of is in an echo of Coretta Scott King, who on June 19th, 1968, said, I stand here on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. This is at the Poor People's Campaign and said, we have a rally today to, to make a demand of this government that my husband made from these very steps in 1963, and I'm doing it on Juneteenth to make the point that we are in that tradition. Hey, what does that look like in 2021? It looks like the Poor People's Campaign going to West Virginia and telling Joe Manchin, I hear you, bruh, but tell your boy Chuck Coke because we renegotiating the terms. So of course, we can't do nothing wow. but fight. Wow. Talk to me about before you go narrative.com. Oh, well, that's an attempt to free us. That's a, that's our, uh, our friend, uh, Karen Hunter, who like you is a huge media presence who has always tried to create a classroom wherever she goes. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went with my friend, Ajwa Bakwe Osmore to her uh, Sirius XM uh, show and we talked about curriculum. And then we started doing a weekend thing over the last year on YouTube. And now we've moved to this narrative piece, which is basically a space for us to convene, to talk, to discuss uh, how these things, how the study of the past can free us and to build networks. And so I'm very honored, brother, because you know, 
as an HBCU professor. You at Morehouse, me at Howard, and you know how our black colleges are. We love them, we represent them. I told Joe Biden yesterday, he said, Howard is the second best HBCU in the country behind Delaware State. I said, Mr. President, I'm a graduate of a moral land grant Negro college. So like Dell State, I went to Tennessee State and I put all those state HBCUs first. And he just started laughing. My point is this, that ain't gonna free <laughs> us either. We gotta build some offshore spaces. And so you know what I'm talking about, brother. The HBCU, many of them are black faced white schools with their aspirations. So mm. we gonna keep working in them, but we gonna build something different so that we can control that and open it up to the people and dissolve that class tension. We don't like to be too intersectional when it comes to class. We gotta be together on this. But I think, thank you for asking, man. I, I tell Karen, you, you brought that Oh, up. no, that's, that's important, man. The work we do here at Black News Tonight and really the work we all are trying to do as a community is about getting us free. And you get free through media, you get free through school, but you mostly get free by loving black people and doing the work on the ground. And like you said, a lot of that work on the ground is gonna come outside the reach of the school, outside the purview of the media. It's gonna be black folk doing what black folk got to do to get free. And that's why we have you here. And that's why we're gonna keep the conversation going. Everybody, if you would like to study and learn from Dr. Carr, and you should, as well as many other prominent black intellectuals, make sure you log on to narrative.com. That's narrative with a K. I think Dr. Carr wanted to be a Kappa. It's K N A R A T I V E. <laughs> I love that. Boy, you hey, look, I, look, I, I'm, I'm going to ignore that pan Hellenic smoke and tell everybody that's one of the reasons why this brother started Uncle Bobby's and why Philadelphia Freedom Schools relies on him. Because we know that everybody can't pay tuition. And, brother, I just want to say how much we love and respect you for that intervention in terms of literacy. That is that is that is a central tenet. And I appreciate that. I'm going to ignore that cap of shade, brother, because you know it's all Greek love. We ain't Greek anyway. We black men happen to be in some Greek. Be black. <laughs> no question. That's it. That's it.